All righty. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Hannah Waltz, and I am the US Free Expression Programs Coordinator at PEN America. It is such an honor to be here in Uruguay today to celebrate World Press Freedom Day with you, and, and welcome to those joining virtually as well. A special thanks to the conference organizers. We very much appreciate you. For those, who, for those of you who aren't yet friends with our organization, a brief introduction PEN America is a nonprofit that stands at the intersection of literature and human rights to protect free expression in the United States worldwide. We champion the freedom to write and work to unite writers and their allies to celebrate creative expression and defend the liberties that make it possible. We are part of the global PEN network that includes PEN Uruguay. We advocate for writers around the world who face serious repercussions, including imprisonment, harassment, and violence for their work. And we publish research examining global threats to freedom of expression, including our annual Freedom to Write Index. We are active on interna international press freedom issues, including our support of the annual introduction of the bicameral World Press Freedom Day resolution in DC. We also work to protect the rights of global artists through our Artists at Risk Connection Program, which safeguards the right to artistic freedom of expression by connecting persecuted artists with direct support. As I mentioned, I work on our domestic team, advancing free expression work in the US, ranging from issues of press freedom to assembly rights, media literacy, digital technology, and local journalism. Thanks to UNESCO's virtual platform, it's my pleasure to welcome our PEN members joining remotely in the United States as part of our PEN Across America program, which provides resources to mobilize PEN America communities around the country. A couple years ago, we published a report that detailed the decline of local news outlets and its implications for our democracy, including a corresponding decline in government accountability, civic engagement, and now access to essential health and community information amid a public health crisis and seemingly never ending waves of disinformation. The impacts were, of course, felt most dramatically by communities of color, immigrants, rural populations, and other minority groups, only making matters worse because we know the critical role community media plays in the fight against targeted disinformation campaigns. So this World Press Freedom Day, we celebrate the crucial role community media around the world plays in defending a free and healthy press. A strong media ecosystem is one that embraces community and diasporic media outlets, prioritizing audiences that may be underserved by mainstream media and other news sources. Localized, culturally attuned, fact-based reporting powers the civic engagement of people who have historically faced barriers to participation. Community media enables better informed and wider involvement in public discourse. In-language reporting makes accessible resources and tools that communities need to hold the powerful accountable. Essential information, especially when delivered by trusted community journalists, builds resilience against disinformation and surveillance and promotes healthier, safer, and fuller lives. Journalists that reflect the values and experience of those that they serve connect voices and stories across the spectrum of nationality, socioeconomic status, and spoken language. We believe that community media informs, empowers, protects, and connects. And with that, 
I am so honored to introduce our panel moderator, someone I have long admired for her amazing work in community media, Kavita Rajagopalan, who is the Community Engagement Manager at the Center for Community Media at the City University of New York's Craig Newmark Journalism School. Here she creates spaces for community media journalists and partner organizations to connect, share resources, and elevate their expertise. She is a writer and published author specializing in global migration. Kavita will introduce the rest of our esteemed panelists tuning in from around the world. Thank you so, so much for joining us in celebrating the power of community media and protecting the public from disinformation and surveillance. Is that I'm not physically with you in beautiful Uruguay. I am so jealous, uh, although we are finally beginning to have some decent weather here in New York City, but uh, can't compare to paradise. Uh, and to be in community with all of you, and I do hope that we'll be able to connect in the future. If any of you are interested in community media uh, across the United States, serving diasporic communities and global communities and communities of color, please do not hesitate to reach out to me directly or to the rest of my colleagues here at the Center for Community Media. We are here for you and for press freedom, and we are delighted to celebrate this, this momentous day with all of you. Uh, in brief, let me introduce our panelists. We have with us in person, the wonderful Mukhtar Ibrahim, who is the founding publisher and CEO of Sahan Journal which is a nonprofit online news organization. At this point, I believe just three years old, Mukhtar, am I wrong? Um, That's correct. That is dedicated to, co it's just three years old and in this time has made a tremendous impact, not only in local policy, but also in the national conversation. And this organization is dedicated to covering Minnesotan immigrants and communities of color. He previously did work as a staff writer for the Minnesota Star Tribune and for Minnesota Public Radio News. And he's also written for the St. Paul Pioneer Press, Al Jazeera English, BuzzFeed News, and the Wisconsin Center for Investigative Journalism. Muhtar is among the first trained journalists of Somali background in Minnesota and in the country as a whole, which is powerful because Minnesota is home to the country's largest Somali community. Um, thank you so much for being with us, Muhtar. I'm also deeply honored to introduce you all to Natalia Gumenyuk, who is a Ukrainian author, documentary filmmaker, and a journalist. She does specialize in conflict reporting and in human rights and foreign affairs. Gubanyuk is the founder of the Public Interest Journalism Lab, which is aimed at popularizing public spirit journalism and overcoming polarization. Since the 2014 revolution in Ukraine, she has reported on events in Eastern Ukraine. And she is one of the few journalists who have regularly traveled to occupied Crimea. Um, we are so honored to have uh, Natalia here today, specifically with her expertise as her country navigates unspeakable terror. Uh, we are also very excited to have with us, I'm going to briefly introduce the final panelist who has not yet been able to join us, but in the event that she does join us, I want all of you to at least know who she is. This is Dina Meza. She uh, was born in Cofradia, Honduras, and Dina has been recognized by the Penn International Center, by Amnesty International, the Index on Censorship and Reporters Without Borders for her incredible work as a journalist and human rights advocate. Currently, Dina is the driving force behind the creation of the Honduras Penn Center. So without further ado, let me just uh, jump into our conversation. I'd like to be able to give us all opportunity to have a longer conversation on the back end of this. As Hannah so eloquently mentioned, community media has a very specific role to play in the media landscape in any country. We know mainstream local news organizations are also being lost in most countries around the world, specifically in the United States, but community media is unique in that it is a media ecosystem that has long served people whose voices and stories are never seen or heard in the traditional local media landscape, even um, before these losses of local news outlets. Um, and because of this role, as Hannah mentioned, what community ma media are able to do are offer what is increasingly an important alternative to the social media discourses and influencer output that really does 
present back to communities of color their own stories and reflect them back to themselves. So I'd like to first turn to Mukhtar and ask this question. Uh, we understand that community media are generally uniquely defined by the needs of the specific communities that they serve. In some cases, this means they publish in certain languages or reach audiences on innovative platforms or in unique and creative formats. So how does your outlet, how does your journalism define and reach the community that you serve? Um, yeah, thank you, Kafitha. Um, yeah, my name is Mukhtar Ibrahim. I run Sahan Journal, um, a nonprofit news organization in Minnesota. We cover um, Minnesota immigrants and communities of color and, and refugees. Um, so we have a broad spectrum of um, demographics that we hope to reach, uh, including uh, some of the largest immigrant groups in the state of Minnesota, including the Hmong community that has been uh, settling in Minnesota for the past 40 years, and um, the Somali community, which has been there for you know the last 20, 30 years, and also the Latino community, the African-American community, uh, and the native community. And our approach is to um, provide information and journalism that truly reflects the lived experiences of these communities who have been traditionally been ignored or misrepresented in, in the local media. Um, this project came about during my experience working in some of the largest newsrooms in, in the state of Minnesota and seeing firsthand how stories related to these communities, particularly the Somali community, are covered. And they are mostly from the lens of um, terrorism if you are a Muslim, uh, crime if you are black, and uh, immigration or deportation if you are a Latino uh, person. And I really wanted to go beyond that because those are not the topics or issues that define these communities. They, they play a major role in um, the economy, the politics, the culture, the arts of the state of Minnesota, and they have been transforming um, the state in the last you know, uh, decades. And I wanted to have a place that uh, chronicles uh, the challenges, the transformations, the successes of these growing communities who are now making up 25% uh, of the state's population. That number was about 10-12% uh, a decade ago. So you can see how these communities have been growing and, and, and uh, stabilizing population decline in, in Minnesota, which, which is usually predominantly a white state. And um, since you know the last three years, en los últimos tres años he estado trabajando con esto y hemos mostrado cómo se ve el periodismo local que verdaderamente verdaderamente se dedica a las historias de las comunidades de color y estamos trabajando en el campo. Las comunidades confían en nuestro trabajo. Y por supuesto mostramos nuevas historias, nuevos temas, nuevas problemáticas que son tan relevantes para estas comunidades. Y nuestras historias han sido recolectadas por algunos de los principales periódicos del país, como el New York Times o Washington Post, y también por medios locales, como por ejemplo The Tribune o NPR, que también eh, han coproducido y copublicado nuestras historias. Entonces la idea es realmente poder brindar un, brindar un perfil de un periodismo de tipo único para aquellas comunidades que se han visto eh, dejadas de lado durante tantos años. Muchas gracias, Mukhtar. Natalia, me gustaría pasar a ti. Un punto que mencionó Mukhtar en su respuesta a la pregunta que hice es que en general las comunidades, no, eh, el periodismo que necesitan no pueden simplemente ser definidas por un asunto único o simplemente por su propia identidad y que los medios de comunicación tienen que posicionarse para poder construir confianza. No puedo pensar en un mejor contexto que la guerra como algo que probablemente pueda desmantelar o desintegrar la confianza. Entonces, quizás podrías contarnos eh, sobre tu trabajo en medios comunitarios, pero en un contexto completamente diferente dentro de Ucrania. Eh, quizás podrías compartir un poco de cómo definen ustedes el periodismo comunitario en este contexto, en Ucrania, en un país que actualmente atraviesa una situación de guerra, y cómo lo, lo llevan adelante. Hola, sí, es un contexto bastante único bajo el cual estamos operando, no porque Ucrania sea única, sino porque 
las, eh, por los desafíos que enfrentamos en una situación de guerra. Nunca ha habido tanta guerra, una guerra en un sentido de afectar a la soberanía del país y la democracia. Entonces, por supuesto, eh, durante esta guerra, el gobierno se ha vuelto más accesible, de hecho, y hay más oportunidades para que los periodistas que quieren trabajar, eh, por supuesto, son asuntos y preocupaciones muy complejas en lo que refiere a la seguridad. Hemos visto el caso de los 18 periodistas ucranianos e internacionales que fueron asesinados, particularmente durante bombardeos. Y, por supuesto, es, eso es la mayor complejidad. Pero al mismo tiempo, la confianza dentro de la sociedad ha aumentado muchísimo. La sociedad nunca estuvo tan unida. Y el nivel de confianza entre la sociedad civil y los medios, y el gobierno, y las instituciones estatales, realmente ha llegado a niveles sin precedentes. Al mismo tiempo, eh, hay algo completamente distinto, porque Ucrania es un país muy grande, tiene 40 millones de habitantes, es el país más grande de Europa geográficamente hablando, y resultó que la línea de frente está trabajando con cientos de kilómetros y muchas regiones y cientos de pueblos han sido atacados y la forma en la que se ha peleado esta guerra, porque es cierto que Rusia ha destruido las estaciones de televisión y centros de comunicación en particular en aquellos pueblos que se encuentran bajo asalto, a veces por ejemplo ni siquiera tenemos internet en esos lugares y también tenemos el caso en el cual por ejemplo eh, eh, no tiene electricidad siquiera durante mucho tiempo. Entonces lo que hace que entienda que esto es diferente y que es importante respecto a esto es que, por ejemplo, tenemos internacionalmente las noticias de la ciudad del pueblo de Mariúv, que eh, estamos hablando de medio millón de personas, más allá de que se considere un pueblo, y está prácticamente destruida. Y hemos visto muchísima eh, muchísimo reportaje internacional, pero va a haber solamente una cantidad limitada de historias de las personas en Mariupol que van a poder contar sus historias. Quizás algunos cientos o un par de miles, como mucho, pero estamos hablando de más de medio millón de personas afectadas, porque esto es un ataque sobre toda la ciudad. Y cada persona seguramente tiene su historia. Entonces tenemos cientos de miles de personas que siguen ahí, otras cien, otros cientos de miles tuvieron que reubicarse a otras partes del país y sus historias hay que contarlas y por ende es crítico estar ahí. Quizás el mundo recientemente haya escuchado el nombre de la ciudad de Puchet, que es, solía ser un área suburbana muy linda de la capital que realmente a nadie nunca le habría importado. Yo soy reportera nacional y nunca me importó. Y, y, y bueno, tenían una estación de televisión en esa ciudad que funcionaba. Funcionaba como una estación provincial. You know, there are we we would do the big stories for international Ukrainian media on the war crimes, which could be the testimonies for the you know uh, the tribunal, and that would be very specific. At the same time, the town is rebuilding, the people are coming back. When when I for the first time was there myself, uh, because this is city I live in the Ukrainian capital, so many people were asking me like, can you see? Uh, because a lot of journalists live in this uh, uh, suburb, and they would say like, is my house standing what's happening to it should am i able to be back and there should be somebody to tell this story the, the story also of the revival of this town the fact that the bridges are already rebuilt a month after and uh but the stories that there would be the story of you know every person you know because the scale is immense and having kind of such a broad country and having all these layers of this conflict with propaganda with international you know um uh amplification uh, and the history you know the uniqueness of this conflict you know since the second world war uh with the attack on the independent sovereign country um uh, it, it, uh 
so that would be really something that there would be incredible amount of the towns and the cities and the communities uh, which should be served and there is a general framework what national media should do what regional media should do uh, but like a neighborhood need they would have a specific issues which probably would be too small but you know they are in a lot of cases they are the life and death situation for the people who reside in these towns or villages, especially like sometimes we have now captured and occupied some towns, some towns or villages in the, the, the region of the eastern Ukraine on the southern Ukraine. There could be randomly a, a, a town of, you know, 30 southern people, which didn't really have any like national significance, but it turned to have now. And we want to know what's happening there. And those particular people should be served. And there are of them. And uh, so the, the role is incredibly. So, 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 so this is kind of very, you know, basic thing uh, in, in quite an, a, a dire situation. But that would be my very simple, uh, you know, explanation how it's absolutely crucial to for every story to be told and for every story uh, which couldn't be not that dire and not that tragic, not the ones to go for the International War Tribunal, but which remains important for a particular person who lost their house, who lost, you know, something like the part of own history, um, or even if it would be also the destroyment of the local historic museum, for instance, which should be taken care of. And of course, in what's happening, nobody would you know, apart from this community, who would care about that? And that's really, in fact, the history of the country and the history of the conflict. But first of all, the the, the, the human story the should be to, to be preserved. Uh, yeah, I think you make such a powerful point when you say not the dire and not the tragic, and we, when you say that. It, when you say that uh, you're you're talking about inside of a community, the full range of the stories, I see so many common overlaps with what Mukhtar was also speaking about, about how people are more than the issues that they re represent to a national or an international audience. And community media has a unique opportunity to capture the full humanity of a community and the full range of its experiences. And also the point that you made about how a local museum may seem like a hyper-local issue, but that is also the storehouse of that community's history. Uh, so thank you so much for that insight. I see, Dina, we have been joined by you. Um, are you able to hear us, Dina Meza? All right, I don't see you on the screen and I don't hear anything from the interpreter. So I'm going to go back to Mukhtar. Uh, and I want to ask a little bit about specifically disinformation. How does disinformation move through the community that you serve? And what are the main sources of disinformation that target your community? You've mentioned that many of the members of your community are immigrant communities. So there are immigrants from all over the world. Do you find that there's a lot of disinformation coming from global and transnational sources? Or is it more likely to be kind of local disinformation or from the state level or online trolls, non-state uh, actors, polit political op operatives? influencers just trying to make their name in social media thought leaders what do you see and how do you respond to them yeah i think um the main source of uh, disinformation in the communities that we cover um, are primarily social media uh particularly uh facebook and instagram and uh somewhat you know snapchat and uh, other places that people usually talk to and get the information um, and and the most um, information, I think, misinformation or disinformation usually comes through people who have a lot of followers, who um, are trusted, somewhat trusted by the community, right? And um, there was actually a case in 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 our city, the Minneapolis, where we have been covering issues related to um, the misappropriation of funds uh, intended for you know, children who are disadvantaged or low income, and the funds usually uh, comes from the Minnesota Depar Department of Education and, and, and the federal government. So we have been covering those issues, and there was um, 
uh, a person on, in, in the Somali community who has large followers who basically uh, rounds up information and news related to the community and propagates that to his followers. And he, he made a series of uh, videos about, about particularly me and, and the uh, website that I ran that were particularly uh, defamatory and also really uh, full of uh, disinformation. Um, saying, you know, what we do, what we are doing are lies. Um, we are not credible news organization. We are, um, uh, you know, losing subscribers, which we don't have. Uh, the journal is run by my brother and I. My brother is a doctor and he's not even a journalist. And telling the community like really uh, deliberate, you know, uh, lies about us. So people turn to those kind of people, figures who have a lot of social media followers and see themselves as um, real journalists, but also are not fact-checking information, uh, not trying to call up sources or, you know, uh, read the information that we are providing to the community. So that's, I think, where things are happening in the communities that we cover, uh, mainly circulating around social media. And also sometimes, you know, um, figures and outlets that are anti-immigrant or anti-Muslim also uh, propagating and uh, spreading a lot of this information. There was a case um, uh, about a couple of years ago where um, a group that had, you know, uh, some animosity toward the Somali community came uh, to Minnesota and they did a video series alleging there was a, a voter fraud, uh, particularly targeting the Somali community. And we, we tried to um, go out and debunk those uh, information, that, uh, the lies and disinformation that have been uh, spread by uh, these out, uh, this outlets and actors and inform the community in a way that will make sense to them. Whether that means, you know, uh, spread, uh, publishing the information on social media, translating the information into language that are familiar to the community, or uh, partnering with community figures who have deep trust and, and standing in the communities to tell them that what they are hearing and what they are consuming are not, are not actually real information, but something that um, are deliberately targeting the community. So we, we try to really analyze the landscape, uh, go ahead and, and uh, correct those disinformation, and sometimes address them on, on online, go on TV, uh, radio stations, that these communities um, get the information, and to be very, very much well-rounded in how we respond to this information that we come across on multiple platforms. Thank you so much. I, I want to actually ask Natalia, I understand disinformation. So two of the things that Mukhtar had mentioned that I'd like to pull out is this word uh, trust. So trust operates at a couple of different levels here. And he was saying that one of the challenges that they face in their journalism is that disinformation is coming from influencers who are trusted members of the community. But one of the things that community media does have is a different type of trust and that he can counteract that trust with its embeddedness within the community, which also is something that you had mentioned in your earlier comments. So I'm wondering if you can speak to, I understand that you have a lot of expertise in dealing with disinformation specifically from uh, Russian actors or from other actors outside of Ukraine. I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about the sources of disinformation that you see and how you respond to create trust or use the trust that you've already built up in your community journalism to respond? Um, so like really uh, speaking on this particular level, we, we our discussion is, is focused. I've given you a different example. So I've been reporting on the conflict and working in different capacities, uh, which was very different for the last eight years. It was a low scale frozen conflict in the part of Ukraine, uh, which was still you know under the Russian occupation, but we needed really to debate that there is a Russian involvement. So you know, like for eight years, there was this kind of grayness in particularly when, while the, uh, the the media, the Ukrainian media, independent media had to kind of prove, uh, you know, that Russia is behind the their proxies, which all of a sudden became irrelevant because, you know, it became so open. We don't need to prove that Crimea is occupied by Russia now. Uh, but 
uh, coming back, especially in the in the last years. So there was still the part of the part of the eastern part of the country where there was a conflict was more or less randomly divided into the two parts. There was no any ethnic, linguistic, any any reason. It just happened to be that one village was in one side, another town in another side. So quite a lot of people for eight years were were cut uh, down from Ukraine. Uh, what we could do, we we should could work with a smaller outlets in particularly on the local level uh, to help them, you know, as mentors, my organization, Public Interest Journalism Lab, and, and really say that there is a lot of disinformation. There is a lot of propaganda. Uh, actually, they would receive a lot of news from Russia, uh, like from the Russian state propagandist media, not independent media. They won't trust independent Russian media, which also existed. Uh, and uh, it was always meant to confuse people, to undermine trust in the government, to undermine trust in, you know, rules, laws. And uh, so our task, we actually worked with one, you, you, you used some of the tools from the Chicago-based organization called Harkin, which really works with the communities. And our idea is instead of like, preaching the people how they should be uh, for those independent reporters who worked in quite a dangerous and difficult environment, a smaller town somewhere, you know, uh, in, in close to the, uh, the, to the, this conflict line. Um, uh, our question was like, don't try to, to preach people. Don't think that if they're confused by propaganda or by anything, uh, learn what is useful for them uh, ask them and you know put the questions and in fact they started to it was quite a project we wanted to start after the war how the people can be useful for their communities and all of a sudden there were a lot of young reporters who started those media they said like oh in, we we really changed our operation we started to ask the people uh, you know what they needed and they really were concerned about a lot of social issues and we were very helping them to tell this or that you know the issues how the how to bring the bus to the village how to you know i mean the issues on the education very practical things and a Upon that, there was a trust. And when the conflicts started, uh, they really got also incredible feedback from their audience in their towns. You know, like the knowledge, the concerns, uh, they could verify uh, the information. So it, it has a very, very practical dimension. At the same time, there is something else to, to, to add from my side. Uh, so prior to this full-scale invasion, our organization for the last two years in particular was focused on how to overcome polarization, how to really, you know, look deeper, look to the people, to the vulnerabilities, you know, like work with the real needs of the people. And I was quite cautious and probably even a bit fed up about the whole discussion about disinformation, fake news, because it was a bit too much of it, you know, like, like propaganda, uh, politicians use this notion too much. Some people use it in, in favor, uh, you know, like speaking about the propaganda accusing their political rivals. Uh, so I was more skeptical. I think like we should be more nuanced, you know, it's more sophisticated. And unfortunately, I should say that I still think it's very, you know, a uh, deep thing. There are some things we need to, uh, to work in depth. At the same time, recently, I've been to the village uh, near Chernihiv on the north of uh, Ukraine, which was under the Russian occupation for months. And there was a story where 380 people were kept in the basement of the school while Russian troops were on them using the people as a human shield. They were not allowed to get out of this place. 11 elderly had died because they couldn't really properly breathe in this space because the place was for 80 people and there were like 400 people, there were up to 400. Uh, there were some, uh, it was not the ho most horrible place, but there were people shot in that village. And, you know, uh, they spend these months with the Russian soldiers. They speak Russian, you know, like they can communicate. And uh, when they were asking those soldiers why they came, what was the reason for that? They, the, the, they Russian soldiers, were bringing this pack of the popular paper, Komsomolskaya Pravda, one of the oldest Russian newspapers, 
uh, which I also found in the village, where the first page was exactly said the justification of the war, why, why there is no other way rather than attack. He was writing about all fakes, that the all kind of casualties are fakes, including the with the photo of the person I know personally who has been, you know, uh, uh, wounded because I did the story about this person. And it was like a pure instrumental propaganda in a paper given. And other journalists also said they've seen this paper. It was a special issue. I read very clearly. There were seven million copies published. There was a name of the editor, the name of the managers, the name of all the people who worked on this edition, and it is the most popular Russian newspaper for decades. It was an absolutely instrumental for the war crimes. And then I thought, like, didn't I over um, made it too sophisticated that, of course, there is this in the democratic societies, there is a different way of, you know, dealing with the propaganda and disinformation. It's very sophisticated. So we need to think about the trust, the way how you should be useful. That's what the whole my organization was doing, you know, uh, when the society is confused, whether it would be vaccination or social media or kind of influencers, which proliferating some uh, crazy things. But we cannot forget that in some societies, especially if they're authoritarian, especially if they're like that, and if, if they're like, th that would be the case when there would be very basic, old fashioned, 7 million copies of the paper handed to the army as an excuse, as a reasoning to, to, to actually uh, create the war crimes and to kill the people, capture people and occupy the villages. So really, I think that we can't really forget at this level. So we, we, we see the one from inside, how it works in, let's say, democratic pluralistic society, more sophisticated and something very blunt. Wow, thank you so much for that. I think that's really an important perspective for, I think for US audiences to hear here because I think uh, I I don't I can't speak for Muftada, but I definitely have shared your perspective that that there's this kind of politicization of this term disinformation and that we only use it to describe information that maybe we politically disagree with or that maybe the context is slightly different or the belief system is slightly different and then there's this fog of confusion around what we call disinformation or not but this is a very clear unequivocal example but I want to respond to what you said about how community media is unique in that it responds to the practical needs, the everyday needs of people who are in a place, whether that place is undergoing war crimes or surviving, or whether that place is just dealing with a slow creep and loss of rights being targeted by, you know, agents of the state, for example, the way that, you know, immigrant communities in Minnesota might be. Um, and so I'm wondering if, if you could maybe speak both of you to, you know, it, it does seem like we saw a lot throughout the pandemic, how community media pivoted away from dealing with covering politics and political issues to really do focus these very simple, clear information. Where do you get your vaccine? Where do you get food? How do you deal with day-to-day -day needs? And that was very powerful. But I'm wondering also now, in the last couple of years, we're hearing increasing reports that disinformation, there's a direct line between disinformation and uh, online harassment, and then escalating into real life interpersonal violence. And I wonder if either of you have experienced any of that progression, or if you've seen any kind of shift in the move from just disinformation campaigns to actual targeted harassment, and how you within your organization have responded to that issue and been able to uh, to stem any of those issues at all. I know there's a lot of polarization in all of these communities, and I'll open that up to either of you. Uh, either of you are welcome to join. And Dina, I'm also going to just once more ask Dina if you're available. Um, I would love to hear from you, but I understand there's also been a challenge with the uh, Spanish language translation. But if you are uh, if you are able to speak, would you just wave at me if you're able to hear? The interpreter, would you wave at me and then maybe I can come to you next? Sí, muchas gracias. Eh, tengo problema. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm having some issues because I'm using my mobile phone and I have no access to the translation. That's why. So I can only listen in English and I only get a part of that because I have no access to the interpreters. Let me see if we can fix that problem. 
Yo pero, regresaré. Lo pero, siento, mi español es muy horrible. I'm sorry about my Spanish. I'm trying to find a way to get to the office so I can use my computer. That. Okay, thank you. So then, uh, I, for those of you who don't speak Spanish, it sounds like Vina is having some difficulty with the simultaneous translation, and she is now going to try and join us from another location to see if she can connect that way. But let's go back to Mukhtar and Natalia. Can you think of any examples that you'd be able to share of whether you see online harassment escalating to real interpersonal violence and how you have responded to it in your journalism and how that's impacting your ability to do, to do your journalism. Mukhtar, would you like to respond yeah, to that? Sure. Um, yeah, I think we are fortunate that we haven't seen that level of harassment um, since we have been uh, doing this. Um, I mean, there are people who can you know, see stuff on social media, trolls, you know, who might not like what we write um, or upset about how we frame some stories. But in general, um, our reporters and staff haven't come across a real threat that, you know, escalates to be some kind of physical threat. And um, yeah, I cannot uh, uh, fathom, you know, what that will mean for people who are doing this job, you know, it's uh, public service journalism needs to be protected. And if you cannot reasonably do your job as a reporter, being out in the community and, you know, uh, establishing the deep trust and um, getting out, out of your home and going to churches and mosques and uh, community events and centers and uh, all that, I think if, if people are threatened, that will limit how, uh, how we do our journalism and reporting but um, so far, I don't think we have seen any uh, threats that could undermine uh, our reporting and, and the job that our staff uh, do every day. I think I have quite an interesting case in, in, in which I think that it's interesting to speak about the Ukrainian society as a community under threat at the moment. But being very clear about your question, so one thing we I researched earlier, I think like prior to war, I had the time to to kind of more sophisticated research. Uh, the the phenomenon of uh, which is um, I, I think could be described in academic way as the manufacturing consensus, which is created by the algorithm and also by the trolls. Which idea is behind that the trolls or the algorithm. Uh, are able to amplify something um, in, in the scale when when one human has one voice on Twitter and, for instance, the propagandist or somebody running the online harassment campaign would have, like, all of a sudden, technically, by technical means, thousands. But what it creates, it creates this strange mix that a lot of people would think this is a public opinion, this is a popular opinion. And a person who probably... Uh, would be, a, you know, a, a, you know, res res arguing for vaccination, or there would be somebody who, you know, do the independent reporting in Russia, let's say, would be absolutely like attacked, and the person won't consider that he's attacked by maybe one person with the power to use the trolls and bots, but with the community. The problem, what it helps, that sometimes, why the term is manufacturing consensus all of a sudden the people would think that it's a popular opinion. So even the marginal negative, in the margin, in the negative way to use this term, the marginal groups in the, would think that they would empower them to think this uncivilized behavior is normalized. And the other people would be afraid to speak up because they think like, okay, this hateful message, it's actually popular. And it feels like majority of my Facebook feed kind of are like that. So I better remain silent, which create a, a, a strange feeling that it would, it would create the, the maybe, you know, uh, marginal politicians with the negative messaging, uh, with the probably hate speech would be more important than they are and the people who are probably you know would be supported by the by the majority would feel under threat and they would feel that they are attacked by this big my so there is a very technical way to explain this but that's how it works and actually i do think that's really this negative power of the social media 
how to fight with that. Uh, so actually, it's something we worked for the last couple of years. Our idea was that we need really not just to guess and look at the feedbacks and likes. There should be some real uh, experience. So we, for instance, worked with sociologists and thought like, there is a conflict. What is the attitude of the people regarding this type of information? You know, as a journalist, sometimes we really, it was, you know, a more sophisticated way to do in the public interest journalism lab, but we had, we teamed up with sociologists who in some ideas thought like, is this, is this topic really controversial? Really, let's talk to the different demographics, elderly, city, city, like people in this urban areas or in the, you know, small towns. Do they really, you know, uh, have this big fight over the, you know, Second World War or something, or like this, the topic taken by the propagandist, you know, to, uh, to divide the society? And we turn that, in fact, there are the, you know, common ground between these people. This public opinion is over, you know, overdone. This quite a marginal thought. It's shared by quite a minority group. And in the end, in different things, because we've done this, it was a war, it was the uh, vaccination, the COVID. We always understood that, you know, there won't be, there would be 7% of the people who would believe that in the, in the microchips, in the vaccines, most of the people would have doubts because they really don't know how to do that. And what if you are kind of, uh, I don't know, have some disease. So they would have legit concern. And the media often work today for the needs uh, uh, of, 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 you know, like look at the Facebook and try to respond to those stereotypes, uh, not really serving the answers. And that would be way easier in the community. And finally, with what you said, unfortunately, I should say everything I said also had been instrumentalized with the Russian society. And I'm speaking not about the, you know, Russians as the, the people, but I'm speaking about the society, to what extent the society was brought after 20 years of propaganda on the Russian state television against Ukraine, that they would kind of believe that this is probably the majority opinion, you know, that, you know, Ukrainians shouldn't exist as a nation and that was normalized, but also partially by the state television, but also, but all this way, how we work. And uh, just like, get it's almost impossible to do sociology in uh, authoritarian uh, societies, but, in, 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 in the way where we are free, I think the answer is really be cautious about a particular technological way how those uh, probably not not the most reasonable opinions are presented as the as the you know as the representation of the majority, but also like knowing better your audience, your community, your the needs of your community, uh, if necessary, um, uh, to to answer that in, in a different way. Thank you so much, Natalia. I, I actually really, I want to pull out one thing that you said that, you know, this, a lot of these campaigns are intending, are intentional to divide the society uh, and to create this idea that the society is much more polarized than it is. And this topic of polarization, while very different from disinformation, it does kind of dovetail with it. And so I want to briefly turn to Mukhtar, I had actually um, sent a question uh, to Dina, um, and uh, I want to see if she is available to answer. But Mukhtar, in the meantime, I would like to ask you to think a little bit about, as we in the United States head into an election season, how political polarization and online disinformation campaigns are affecting your community and, and the kind of counterweight that you as a community media outlet are able to provide to maybe kind of work towards, you know, kind of healing some of the polarization. And if you have any examples of that. But in the meantime, I want to turn to our final panelist who we have not been able to hear from this whole time, but who has such a wealth of insight and knowledge to share with us. And I wanted to ask Bina Meza if she might be able to speak sort of generally about how she defines community, uh, the community that she serves and how her work has been uh, impacted by disinformation. And I understand that Dina herself has been targeted um, via surveillance and state, uh, state targeting. So if she is able to share a little bit about 
how that uh, experience affected her ability to serve her community and how she was able to then move beyond that and respond in the face of that threat to continue doing community-based journalism. Bina, if you're available and able to speak, we'd love to hear from you. Okay, I'm not hearing anything from Bina or seeing anything from either of the translators. So Mukhtar, I'm going to go back to you. Can you think a little bit, can you speak a little to this issue of political polarization, especially during election seasons? Um, I understand immigrant communities are very much, you know, I think mainstream journalism loves to talk about the immigrant vote or the Asian vote or the black vote or the Latino vote. Um, but you're on the ground covering these communities and their complexity. How do you respond to polarization in your community? And can you share some examples of how you have responded to that in Zahan Journal? Yeah, I think we we kind of uh, look at the issue from how how can we highlight the uh, voting power of these communities who have been targeted by, you know, uh, and time, you can remember, you know, during the last administration, how uh, that was so anti, you know, immig immigration policies have been changed. The people who used to come to the country have been um, turned back. And we, we turned the, um, the, the idea behind and said, you know, these are communities who are so much contributing to everything in the state of Minnesota. How can we shed, their light, shed a light on how they are changing politics in the state of Minnesota? So the idea that we um, uh, came across was, let's highlight all the cases that people uh, get involved. So we are on the ground really reporting on who is running for a city council in a small town in you know, a rural Minnesota. It's mostly um, people of color who want to see, uh, who want to have a seat on the table about issues happening in that particular state as people deepen their roots in areas you know, where they normally, normally don't see each other. So there was a case in a small town in Minnesota where an Ethiopian refugee uh, who, who lived in that uh, city for six, uh, five, six years started to run as a city council member and he won and he became the first black uh, person to, uh, to be elected in that state which is, was historic. So we we are um, trying to approach the idea from not polarization issue, but how can we highlight the contributions of these communities who have been so um, misrepresented in the local media and so attacked by the, the, um, the national politics and see immigrants as people who don't contribute to, to anything, to politics, to economy or culture. And we are really chronicling and uh, profiling and servicing new leaders who are taking up matters into their own hands and saying, you know, I live here. Let me let me stand up and and run for an office. And if I win, I can change, you know, uh, policies or systematic issues that have been affecting the communities. And we have seen, you know, in Minnesota, it's so unique that um, the state legislature, for example, is the most diverse legislature in the history of Minnesota. It has been changing a lot in the last three, four years with people of immigrant background, people of first generation uh, immigrants planning for offices and trying to uh, change, you know, uh, the lives of the communities and neighbors through uh, policies and legislations. And that's what we try to focus on when we cover uh, election seasons, which happen, you know, frequently uh, every couple of years. We also try to provide real information to the communities that we serve in terms of uh, providing a translated voter guide so that they can be very much well informed when they go to the ballot and, and uh, choose who is going to represent them at the local school board or city council or state representative or a congressional district. Um, so we, we try to also provide that comprehensive um, information that will inform the voter so that they can make a good decision uh, that could impact their lives. Thank you so much. Natalia, do you, uh, do you have this similar issue? You were talking a lot about this effort to divide the society, but you'd also mentioned at the beginning of your comments that 
Ukraine right now is more unified than it's ever been before. But again, like you've mentioned, it's a pluralistic society. You're talking about a very ancient society that has many different faiths and a long history of wars and peace and democracy. Um, have you seen in the past in your previous efforts any impact of disinformation on driving divisions within the society? And how have you in community journalism tried to respond to that? Uh, is it okay now? Yeah. Because, uh, yeah, because it was a problem. So I understood I'm I was a bit frozen. So, yeah, in fact, for uh, I was very much concerned about the polarization because it's quite a global trend. And, you know, the way the uh, media markets work, even like the independent media in a lot of places are working for the mobilizing their audience rather than reaching out outside of the bubble. And um, so, so kind of my effort was like really get to know the people outside your bubble. We really speak about the public service journalism, which really makes the, the civilized way of discuss complex issues, but not between our, you know, like city capital activists in the capital and some people in the village or things like that. Uh, so that should be, I don't think any other way than that should be media who by default, you know, waking up in the morning and thinking, you know, how we can actually bring the people together to discuss these complex issues in democracy. So I do think it's something very crucial, not just for Ukraine. It's just very unfortunate that there is such an existential threat to Ukraine, which had to bring up people together and people across different political groups and people who were political opponents, you know, anti-corruption activists would work together with the governors they don't really like very much and the political, because they know this is an existential threat for the society. Either you are kind of are together and you do things together to defend this, the country, uh, whether, you know, uh, it, it, there is no other way. And we understand that, like, if the war is over, we would be back for other kind of issues uh, which would be there. There would be the disagreement, there would be some ideas, which actually, I think it's actually normal. The problem is like whether we'd be able to discuss it in civilized way. So that would be uh, the, uh, the, the, the key for me. Uh, but what is interesting as well, speaking again about the polarization, a lot of international media, and in particular Russian propaganda, was trying to always portray Ukraine as like a very divided country, which honestly was always lesser than many other countries. Any sociology was really saying that people are very much in line in a lot of things. They are pretty liberal, they are pretty tolerant, they, they are ready you know, to accept that they could be very strong with their views, but they are absolutely okay to accept that people somewhere else and other people would have different views. Um, and the reality shows, and in fact, everything which happens now shows actually our sociology was correct. So the propagandists really were trying to exploit the divisions, which in fact isn't really there. And so we don't need to think about like pluralism as a threat. The case is how we work with that and how we make people to meet. And that's where we're coming back to the community media that, of course, it's way more doable in the places, you know, in the communities. There would be people who disagree. And I think the feasible place, it's very hard to do it nationally. You need probably, unfortunately, a war to have nationally to get all those people together. Uh, but in a smaller town, in a smaller place, if people meet in person, and if the moderation is about like letting people know each other, letting searching for some trust building, you would do that. And in and that's beauty of that. So I think we, we can't be frightened about like opponent views. And I'm coming as somebody who is now speaking from the country at war. And I do think pluralism is good. Pluralism helping Ukraine to, you know, fight this war. We really have different opinions, but we understand what is important and what we would be discussed, you know, afterwards. So it's really give strength. It's for good. It's not about unanimous and one opinion, but about the way to create the platforms and the space where people can talk to each other and that's make the country even stronger and society more stronger and resilient. 
Absolutely. What a beautiful message too, the idea that ultimately we, we need our differences, but to be able to meet face to face and get offline. So I'm hoping the next time we meet Natalia, it will be in person face to face. Uh, I'm going to give um, uh, uh, one, uh, one more shot. I'm going to turn back to Lina Meza, um, who I think is, is able to respond now. Lina, are you with us? I'm so sorry. Yes, here I am. Uh, we, we had some uh, criminal issues due to freedom of speech of university students. And we were dealing with that issue, and that's why I was a little behind. So here I am, and I think it's very important to highlight this situation. Honduras is a country that has levels of freedom of speech have gone down and down. But since the coup in 2009, Honduras committed to democratizing um, media outlets. We have community radios that are facing serious issues to communicate or to reach their audiences because of lack of resources. So there's a, a situation there on how to reach the audience. In our case, that we have a digital journal, how to reach these audiences? Basically, we have different audiences in the provinces, in the country, at national level, at international level. But the problem is that not everybody has internet access. Coverage is 25, 28% of people have access to the internet. So they need to include or they need to use their cell phones. But they need to have some credits in their cell phones so that they can use internet. So that is one of the main barriers that we face when trying to reach our audience all over the country. But what we do is to use social networks, Facebook, we also use WhatsApp, Instagram, or sometimes we use encrypted chats when we have security threats. We use Telegram. Now we have new authorities in government. They started in January this year. And they are different from the 12 previous years in which we had a coup. And they bought security software to keep us under control so that they can listen to our communications. And that, that's why when there are very when there's very relevant information to the audience, we have had some problems. For instance, they went to my place, armed men went to my house just to cut internet off. And that happened in the years of the coup d'etat. But right now that we have a different government, we also face similar situations. We have interruptions of the internet. For instance, we are doing some coverage at midnight. And we feel that communications are being interrupted, depending on the topics that we are dealing with. So those are the barriers that we, we have here how to fight misinformation in our media outlets. Basically, we have networks at national level of journalists, and we talk about them, about our work, and how strict we should be when it comes to self-regulations. And try to contrast, compare information. We need to do research, and we need to fight misinformation, fake websites, fake call centers. And those are all the tools that the uh, powerful companies in the, in the country use. They use corporations to start campaigns saying that the government wants to own all the um, communication outlets and also all the utility companies. There's a huge campaign here 
against wages, for instance. They have passed a law that was against labor rights here in the country. So we have a huge campaign by corporations. And those are, that is one of the situations that we are facing here in the country. So they have used information as a product. And now people in Honduras, we don't have access to high quality information. And in fact, uh, there are fewer and fewer opportunities for citizens to have access to the news. We have no opportunities to discuss topics or to provide information about women, for instance. We have no voice. We have no opportunities in traditional media. In the case of female journalists, we are facing many, many problems. Low wages. And so we have very severe problematics. Everything that we do here is very important, but how does it all come together? Uh, how do you, you know, because it's important to get information to the public. So we're doing a lot with the very scarce resources, which for a media outlet that tries to uh, get to the whole of the population is a lot. Thank you so much for that feedback. I think we've heard so much across the country as the country here in the United States deals with political polarization and disinformation and you know, many here believe that there's a, the divides are growing larger here and that there is rising kind of influence of authoritarianism here as well. It's nowhere near what the rest of the world has been navigating. Um, but uh, I do hear that the role of community radio is internationally always been to, to serve and to unite communities that have been torn apart part by war and by coups and violence. So I really appreciate you mentioning that. And also this final point that you make about the financial concrete challenges to doing community journalism. In your case, you're dealing not only with, with concrete assaults, but internet cuts, and then the lack of basic resources. And this is a through line for all community media. Not only is community media um, on the ground working to cover, like Natalia mentioned early, earlier, all of the stories in a place, but you are also dealing with tremendous amounts of scarcity and dwindling resources. So sustainability is a huge challenge. So I wonder if, I'll open this up to all of the panelists, but if you can speak about, one thing that I've heard actually, Mukhtar, one of your colleagues at Sahan Journal mentioned this to me, one of the um, younger uh, Hmong reporters who works for you, that community journalism takes so much more time and effort than just reporting on a news from a simple lens, you know? And that need to do this work with so much time and care, with ever fewer resources and with so many threats is a growing challenge for the, for the sector as a whole. So how are you all dealing with this? We know that community media is vital in this landscape. As so many communities like Bina has spoken here so eloquently about the loss of basic news and information during wartime, as Natalia has spoken to, with immigrant communities who have never been served or represented properly. The news need is there, but the resources are few and they're dwindling and the disinformation tide is growing larger. So how do you see the future for your outlets and how do you, how do you, um, how do you, what are the hopes that you have for this sector in the future? Yeah, I can start. Puedo comenzar. Bueno, de hecho, el periodismo comunitario lleva mucho tiempo y es muy costoso. Estamos intentando tratar problemas que han sido ignorados de alguna manera por otros um, medios de comunicación y tratar de encontrar un nuevo modelo que sea diferente de lo que han hecho los medios tradicionales. Así que intentamos que nuestro periodismo sea implementado de la perspectiva de las comunidades que confían en nuestras historias y que nos transmiten sus historias. Construir esa confianza y de alguna manera tratar de involucrarnos más con la comunidad. Eso es algo muy importante que lleva tiempo y también tratamos de hablar con las personas 
que no confían tanto en el periodismo en general, porque sus historias no han sido bien representadas, entonces tratamos de solucionar ese problema, de rectificar esa situación. Es otro tema que tratamos de abordar, contarle a la comunidad sobre el periodismo y cómo hacemos nuestro trabajo y cómo recabamos nuestra información y compilamos nuestras historias. Así que hacemos muchas actividades al mismo tiempo y podemos suponer, imagínense, entonces cómo eso puede ocupar todo nuestro tiempo y también nuestros recursos. Entonces tenemos que tener un periodismo a escala para poder realizar esta tarea y también tenemos que pagar salarios que sean buenos para que los periodistas sigan trabajando con nosotros. Eso es lo que hemos estado, estamos viendo, uh, una, un número cada vez mayor de personas que dejan el periodismo tradicional. That comes from from those from the perspectives of those communities. So that now there are foundations and corporations that are stepping up to support that kind of journalism, and I think that's really a good sign. But I think um, major foundations need to do more and invest in uh, non-profit and other media outlets that truly um, cover communities that have been left out by uh, the traditional media outlets. And if we If we are really honest uh, with ourselves about seeing everyone covered really well, these outlets need the, the support that will help them to grow, to be sustainable, to hire more reporters, to build their business and infrastructure and operations so that they can compete and, and also uh, grow and cover, and cover more communities. Thank you so much, Natalia and Dina. Final comments uh, for you on the future of community journalism. Yo, yo quisiera agregar que cómo nos eh, podemos enfrentar también a... I'd like to talk about how we can face official propaganda that is used as a punishment and a reward for populations, in this case, community media that need to be informed on mega projects that are happening in the mining regions or the hydroelectrical uh, part of the country, and a series of companies that have uh, depopulated the areas and cast them away from those areas, that entails a lot of risk and therefore um, it's important for uh, community media to be an ally in this regard. And on behalf of the government, they don't uh, fulfill their obligation to strengthen that information from the media themselves because it's not convenient for those uh, groups of power, so we need to fight them as well. And in our media outlets, we, uh, which is Paso de Grande.com, it's an outlet that was born precisely after I came back from the exile back into the country. And it was launched because we believe it was critical uh, to have an alternative media outlet uh, like ours to be available for the public. And how do we work? We work with very scarce human resources. Oftentimes we have to uh, work late at night with information that we are getting with very, very uh, few staff. And we often have to hire, to outsource, uh, you know, journalists that can work with us to help us in research so that we can strengthen the quality of the information that we provide. But one of the things that we uh, affect the structure, we touch the structure. Not only do we uh, inform just uh, from a superficial point of view, but we also talk about the inter intersectionality of vulnerable groups. For example, the uh, LGBTQI community or women or indigenous populations, how these populations that are in a place of severe vulnerability, well, they're often uh, blamed by traditional media uh, for obstructing development. 
and we see that we are a, a, a light for them, a, a lot of hope. And what we need to do is to strengthen uh, our links regionally amongst the different community media outlets to provide each other support both financially uh, as well as in terms of uh, a collaborative kind of journalism that uh, can uh, help each other with funds and how we can regionally perhaps uh, have research groups in journalism to help each other and provide each other support. I believe that um, there's a lot to be done. We need to keep on uh, strengthening these links and the international community needs to look at community media uh, more than ever before to have uh, more opportunities and keep on growing. Fantastic. Yeah, such important points. I'm so glad you were able to join us even uh, uh, for a little bit at the end. Thank you so much for your insight. I really appreciate it. Natalia, any final words from you on the future of community media in this age? Uh, sure. Um, I do think, uh, you know, when I started journalism years ago, we were always said that uh, the journalism, if they're successful commercially, that's the way. I mean, to, um, years after, you know, just speaking what, to what Muhtar said, you know, it's not really the case. The point that there is a there is an idea of the media as a service, and I stand strong behind it. Media is a service. And I really, again, coming back to this war in Ukraine, but because any dire situation show what really matters, what doesn't. So I, I given a totally different example while like talking to the people in the Ukrainian railways, railway, which is, uh, you know, Ukraine is one of the most connected country with the most connected railway. They are moving millions of people, you know, helping them to evacuate and talking to them. They said like they used to run it as a business and then it's service. It's for free. They really organizing it in the full mode and for two months. It's the Ukrainian railway, a service, which is not a company. So the thing is, um, so I, I do think it's really something we uh, should consider in rethinking the way uh, the journalists should be on the ground. Uh, they should go there. And so, of course, the resources are limited, but we need to maybe to explain. So this interesting case uh, about like us, we, we do have now the politician understanding why they need the, 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 the this service. So it's, of course, about the funding, how it should be given from the tax base money. You know, there should be a different models, uh, but there should be some other way about the, the commercial viability of those media. And something else for the editor. Unfortunately, I, I, I don't see, you know, who is in the audience. But as a, also a media manager and an editor, I would say, like for years I've been fundraising. I was dealing about the business. And sometimes I would have a very successful case when, you know, some kind of a, quite a sum would be given to our organization by the donors or anybody. Uh, you know, uh, uh, and I would talk to the newsrooms and they wouldn't really relate to that. And, you know, there would be some bigger, important things. And journalists won't really relate to that that much. But talking on the community level, I saw this inspiration in the eyes of the people and this incredible, you know, fascination when a journalist go and, in fact, gets a feedback from a real person on a very, probably the least important story. But there would be a real person telling something and providing a real feedback to the journalist who never thought that the story about the, you know, um, something about like communal uh, the service of the um, city in, in communal service would be so important because young journalists especially they like the big stories the political stories that thing that how the feedback comes when they receive the award or something like that but it turns to be that thank you from the lady uh who read this article and real feeling that that was useful in fact inspires the journalists more than some big thing we've done and a donation from the person of a very tiny donation of a five dollars would kind of matter for your reporter more than you would say you know i have received a contract for like 
hundred thousands. So I do think for managers and for editors, I really should say it pays back. The community journalism, apart from everything I said as a service, which is, should be very helpful, it's actually for your newsrooms pays back because we do lose things online. So in the part of the activities which we had, we organized the town halls. And, you know, when I'm working with other independent smaller media and maybe there were 10, I mean, the, the, the paper would, would, would be read by hundreds of people, but there would be 10 people who would be debating, 20. But it really makes people feel their audience. And especially while working today so much online, I think we're losing that a bit. And to bring back the profession, you just really say that your journalists would love to be in the field, work with the communities. It's really bring, you know, it's, it's the blood of this profession. It really inspires, it brings energy in the most dire situation. For me, being expert in security, writing the books, writing for international media, you know, and having a very difficult situation at home. It's, you know, really, it's, it's not, I'm not sure my house would survive. But what gives me strength, I talk to the people and they inspire me. And every, you know, interaction with humans really is something the journalists should value. So I do think it's a future. And of course, it's easier on that level than on any other level. Absolutely fantastic way to close. I think we are all on your side on this issue. Congratulations to all of you for persevering in the face of such tremendous odds. And thank you so much for taking the time to share your insight with us with all of the pressure that you're under um, uh, as you navigate all of these difficulties, especially to Natalia, who is in a war zone, and to Dina, who is dealing with a tremendous amount of violence and instability in your environment as well. Thank you very much. And thank you to the audience for joining. And thank you so much to PEN America and to UNESCO for bringing us all together today. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I hope to see all of you in person one day soon. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.